What is honor? What is honor? James said this a couple of weeks ago. Perfect definition. I'm just going to add one word to it, all right? In short, honor is treating people as we should treat Jesus or loving people as we should love Jesus, all right? When you see somebody, you don't see just that person. You actually see Jesus in them, and then you treat them as such, all right? So why is this so important? If you're taking notes this morning, we're going to be writing fast and furious, and I can email these to you because I didn't do a fancy slide. I'm so sorry, but I can get you my notes. Why is honor so important? This is the principle of honor. When we accurately acknowledge who people are in Christ, what it does is it positions us to give them better than what they deserve, and it also positions us to receive the gift of who they are inside of our lives. So when I honor someone, when I love on someone, and I'm going to show you how they're connected, when you give somebody love and you call out who they are, it not only gives them better than what they deserve and gives them something that they need, but it also positions me to receive who that person is in the kingdom and the gifts that they have to offer. Amen? So, I shared a message several weeks ago, and I want to kind of dovetail on that. Uh, I spoke out of Luke 7, talking about the woman who came to Jesus' feet, and I gave five things that she did. And as I was going back through my notes, I saw how some of these are actually related to love and how they're related to honor. So if you're taking notes, the first thing that she did, and you may have written these down weeks ago, she came and she stood at Jesus' feet, all right? And that was the first thing she did. And all the stuff after that is because of her love for him. Because she loved Jesus so much, this is the way that her love was manifested, is she came to him and she stood at his feet. And this spoke of her faith and expectancy. This is where she stopped whatever she was doing, and she said, I'm going to come to the feet of Jesus. The second thing that she did is that she bowed and she wept at his feet. And these were, I said, tears of repentance and gratitude. So this isn't just tears of, oh, you know, I'm repenting and I've done these things and all that. But I'm also, these are tears of the greatest gratitude because of what you did for me and who you say that I am. The third thing that she did, and this is where we get to honor, she washed and she wiped his feet. So, out of honor, when no one else in the house did this for him, she chose to come and lay her glory at Jesus' feet and wash and wipe his feet and honor him. And the fourth thing she did is she kissed his feet. And this speaks of affection and surrender. A kiss says, and we talked about this, when you kiss, it's saying, I'm committed to you and I'm giving myself to you. And then the fifth thing she did is she gave the oil and anointed his feet. And this speaks of consecration or dedication. This is where that she took all that she had and she laid it at the feet of Jesus. Now what I want to do today is kind of go along with that. I want to talk more about three and four where she was actually washing and wiping his feet and kissing his feet. And this is because of the love that she had for Jesus. These are the things that she did here. And I want you to pay, pay close attention to this. She took this place of surrender. And as she's washing and wiping and kissing his feet, I want you to think about Jesus' feet in this story. These are often the dirty and the neglected and the rough parts of Christ's body. And if I could even go a little bit further deeper into that, these are often, in this story in Luke 7, this was the dirty and the neglected and the rough because of the the roads he walked on, members of his body. And I hope you hear what I'm saying this morning, that today I want to talk about loving and honoring people, and sometimes it's the difficult places that you get to love them, to get down to that level, to the feet of Christ, to those members of his body. The inconvenience of it, because if you think about that, I know inconvenience, you're like, you know, you shouldn't say that word because, you know, obviously he gave his life for us, but how do we act sometimes? The inconvenience of actually getting to the feet of Christ where those dirty members are, the dirty parts of his body are, and to begin to love them at that place. And then I want you to consider where Jesus was walking. He was walking on dusty and hard roads, so rough and callous feet, probably in how some of these people that 
he wants you to love on are kind of rough, a little bit, a little dusty. But I wrote this down. Her lips of affection are hard-pressed against the members of his body. And because of her love for him, it overtook her reasoning. It overtook her will. It overtook her boundaries. So everything that she set up, you're thinking, I can't love this person because of this, this, and this. Or because, oh, here we go. Because they're Republican or because they're Democrat. Because they're, yeah, I just brought politics in here. I can't love that person because of their, their view on things. But when you love Jesus and you, and you choose to come to him and surrender and say, God, I love you, then you submit those boundaries and that will, and you give that affection to those parts of his body. Something else I want you to consider this morning is, did you know that you can worship God as you love people? If you want to turn to Matthew 25... We can probably get it on the screen, too. Matthew 25. Matthew and Matthew. Look at Matthew back there. Yeah. Doesn't he do an awesome job? He just smiles at me. Did you know that you can worship God as you love people? Matthew twenty-five forty. It says, And the king will answer and say to them, Assuredly, I say to you, Inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren... You did it to me. And you'll hear people say that I want to hear God more. And I want to feel God. I want to feel his presence. I want to be one with him. And I just want to have uh, God all wrapped up in my life and, and all these things. And you've heard people say that. You want to seek his presence. And of course you do. And maybe I feel like I can't hear him as well as I should. Or I, I feel like I'm kind of distant from him. But have you considered that when you begin to love and you begin to speak life over people, when you begin to pray promises over people, and when you begin to boast about the creator to the created, something changes. And I'm not talking about making something up. I'm not talking about lying and calling somebody what they're not. I'm talking about looking at someone and saying, I see what God sees in you, and I'm calling out what is actually inside of you, and I'm bringing that out here, because even though you might not see it, I see it. And it's because you have the the vision of God, the vision of Christ, looking into somebody's situation, even though they may be dirty and neglected. Oh, this is fun right here. I believe that there's some aspects of God that he locked up in people, and it's waiting to be discovered by a community of honor that would rise up that there's giftings and there's facets of God's face just like a diamond. I believe 100% that there's some things that you cannot experience of God in this life unless you were to go to those places and to those members and to love on those people, that he's locked something inside of them that they offer the body. And until you get to that place, you'll never experience that part of God. Funny story. <laughs> This is great. Talking about how we need each other and how we rely on one another. I love chickens. I don't know if y'all know that or not. I've got Rhode Island Reds, Dominickers. i got all kinds of stuff in my backyard that's about five feet by five feet. But anyway, i got a ton of chickens back there. And I was going to start a Hennessy chicken farm. So I was had this bright dream about a year ago. It was about the same time. It was cold and it was rainy, much like yesterday. And I told Ruth, I said, I'm going to go to Tyler, and I'm going to get this uh, chicken coop that I saw on Craigslist. I said, it's one of a kind. I said all the specs about it and everything. And I was like, if I don't get it now, somebody's going to come get it. Ruth gave me that that loving wife face of like, are you an idiot? Or like, (laughs) if if I would have seen this on the day we were married, I might have reconsidered. But uh, she gave me that loving face and was like, Dana, nobody's going to come get the chicken coop. You should wait about two days because if you do, then it will be a lot less dangerous than it is now. And so I was like, no, I got to go. I'm going to do this thing. She's like, no, you're not. And I said, I'm the man of this house. And I'm starting this chicken farm and I'm going to go. So anyway, I ended up going and we had to have marriage counseling. So I go to Tyler 
And uh, I brought my trailer over there, my dad's truck, because I don't even have a truck to get it. So I'm pulling this trailer, and uh, I get to the guy's house. It takes a big, burly guy, like his truck, and me and this other guy to load it onto the trailer. And as I'm driving home in the rain, I guess it's sleeting at this point. I finally get to my house. Did I mention it's dark? Yeah, it's like nighttime when I'm doing this, too. So I finally get to my house, because it's this time of season, it gets darker quicker. And so I roll up to my house, and uh, I get off and get on the trailer, and I start to try and unload this monstrosity of a chicken coop, and uh, as I'm undoing the latches and trying to pull on this thing, I turn around, and as I turn around, I smell copper. I'm like, why do I smell copper? And then I started to taste copper. It's like, why do I smell and taste copper? And I thought, the only time that I ever felt or smelt or tasted this was when Sensei would pop me right in the face as hard as he could. And what I realized is that when I was on the trailer pulling this thing, I turned around and I stepped. And did you ever see those Looney Tune cartoons where uh, the rake comes up and pops him in the face? Well, the two-by-six on the trailer decided to give way. And as I stepped through, I leaned forward and this two-by-six pops me in the face. It was lovely. Well, here I am. I'm like, okay... Daniel, you're about to pass out, so you need to lie down. You know, blood is coming down my forehead, and uh, my eyes are starting to do this number where I'm about to go out. And so here I am in the rain, in the dark, in the cold, with my big burly jacket on, lying down on my side. So if I vomit, I'll just spew out the side and not choke, and blood coming out of my head. Now, if you can imagine my neighbors driving by in my neighborhood seeing this guy, next to a chicken coop on the back of a trailer. We need each other. We need when somebody says, don't do something, and they have a gift of wisdom, you need to listen to them. Praise God. I got the chicken coop in my backyard. So anyway, often our first response to loving somebody is no. We're like, no, God, I'm not going to do that. I want my boundaries. I want my way. I want to do my thing. But listen, To honor someone, to truly honor someone, you can't honor without love. They go hand in hand. And I said this several weeks ago that just like with love, there's some things that you can't separate from love. One of them is pain. And I I said that you'll experience pain when you're separated from someone for an extended amount of time. Or, you know, there's other things that go along with love, and one of them is honor, that you can't honor someone without loving them. And you really can't love somebody without honoring them. story about Micaiah I wanted to share with you as well, that when she was younger, I say younger, she's four, but when she was like two, we would uh, get her ready for church, and she'd say, where are we going? And I'd say, we're going to church. And she would say, oh, we're going to see James. I was like, yeah, I guess we're going to see James, yeah. And we're going to go see Izzy. I was like, yeah, we're going to go see Izzy. And I was like, okay, we're going to go see James. And she was like, oh, we're going to church on different days. And James obviously, you know, comes over without seeing each other at church. But it was funny that she would associate church with James and Liz, and I guess that she thought that they would stay up here on Sundays and sleep, and then during the rest of the week, then we come back on Sunday, and oh, there they are. They just woke up. And anyway, isn't it funny that people think the same way, that Jesus stays here during the week, and he's here on Wednesdays, but he doesn't go out of here during the week. That they can't experience breakthrough. That they can't experience light. That they can't experience him unless it's here in the service. But what would happen if people saw Jesus come into their jobs? What would happen if Jesus saw him come in the marketplace? And when I say marketplace, it sounds, oh, we're in the you know third century. No, I'm talking like downtown. Like what happens when somebody comes in the salon and they have an experience from heaven anyway when they get a massage, but what happens when our massage therapist is praying in tongues over them and speaking life over them, and all of a sudden they go, I came in one way and I did have knots on my shoulder, but now I'm leaving with like this new outlook on life, and I just feel the presence of God in this place. When Ruth puts that cape over them, she begins to cut their hair, and then all of a sudden they're spilling the beans about their entire life, and they get to the end of it, they're like, I don't know why I did that, and Ruth is like, well, I know why you did that, because Christ is standing here right behind you, cutting your hair. Oh, this is cool. (laughs) 
we employ Jesus over there anyway. What about children's ministry? Can I get a whoop whoop on that? Have you seen our kids lately? Did y'all see them a couple of weeks ago when they're up here praying for us in this place? What happens when those kids go into their schools, the elementary schools and, and the high schools, and all of a sudden they're in the middle of class and the Spirit of God breaks out? Mm. We went to the hospital last week, our life group, in a good way we went to the hospital. And so it was a lot of fun what uh, we did. I'm a really good decorator. I made these baskets and stuff. Ruth is giving me a look. Actually, Ruth made all the baskets and made it look really, really good. Um, we put all kinds of stuff in there. We put mints and gum and snacks and all kinds of stuff you want on night shift. And so we put all the stuff in there, and then we put these little books in there. And it was really, really nice. And uh, our life group went up there. And went, before we went, we just prayed over them. We prayed over um, the people we were going to see. And then we said, we're just going to go in. I say no agenda, but our agenda was to love people. But I said, we're going to go in with no agenda. We're not going to go in and try and force anything on them. We're not going to go in and try and, um, you know, do nothing but love. And when we got up there, Ricky and I were actually the first ones to one of the double doors while the other people went in through the ER. And uh, we saw this lady coming out right off of day shift, and she was worn down. You could see it in her face. She, was, she had her little stethoscope in her bag and stuff, and she was like, I'm ready to get home, have a glass of wine, and just like go to bed. <laughs> and I was just like, you poor thing. So Ricky and I go up to her, and uh, we just have this bag in our hand. We look kind of goofy holding this stuff, and I said, hey, uh, would you like some chocolate? And you know when you say that to a lady coming out off after a shift like that, it's like, hey, you got my attention. But uh, Ricky and I were like, hey, do you want some chocolate and some goodies in this bag? We just want to come up here and bless you and just love on the people here in the hospital and see if y'all need anything. And then she's just like looking at us like, what are you doing? Like, who are you? Is this Palestine? Am I Palestine Regional right now? And then we said, um, do you mind if we pray with you? Do you mind if we just bless you? And then I gave her a big hug, and she's just like sitting there, and she's broken, and she takes this bag, and then she's like, thank y'all so much. You don't realize how much this means to me, and then she just goes on her way, and we do that all through the hospital. We go to the ICU and see a lady that's about to life her husband to Dallas because of something that he was going through, and we go on the third floor and see these other nurses up there and just pray with them before they start their shift, and the looks on their faces of, I mean, I'm sure they knew it here, but I don't know if they knew it here, that Jesus could actually leave this place and actually come to Palestine Regional. And that you can actually love on people, and they can have this life-altering experience just from going up and giving them some chocolate and, and a baggie. Anyway. Working as a respite. Whoa. First hand clap. Whoa. That was cool. I'll drink to that. Working as a respiratory therapist this year, actually for the past, you know, 30 years or whatever I've been doing it, but this year alone, I can't tell you how many people I've seen in their home this year, and I didn't go in with an agenda. I say that, I'm lying. I went in to love them and obviously do business, but I didn't go in with a lecture. I didn't go in with condemnation. Um... I just went in to love on them and to just really just kiss on them and tell them how much. I didn't literally kiss. I'd probably get fired for that. But uh, I would go in and just show them what the kingdom of heaven looks like there in their home. And these people, they're sick and they're, they're weathered, they're dusty, and they seemingly have nothing to give. Because they're, most of them, majority of them are on their way out. Majority of them are, they have no energy because of the, whatever disease process it is. But as you begin to love on them, as I begin to love on them and call things out, I've only had one person that refused for me to pray, pray over them, but everybody else is totally welcome on it. And as I began to do that and draw something out of them, just like we said from the beginning, excuse me, as I began to love on them and give them something more than what they deserve, I was able to receive the gift of what they are in the body. And as I'm sitting there and I'm thinking that I'm bringing them something to help with their life and, and help whatever condition that they're in, little did I know that I'm actually receiving something from them. 
and actually getting something imparted to me. You know something awesome about love? Yes. I'm glad you said yep. That would have been really awkward. I would have walked out. <laughs> love has an incredible ability to remove completely and dismantle shame. Do you know what shame is? Shame likes to make you feel powerless. And what it does is it takes you and it traps you in the mistakes you've made. And then when you're trapped in the mistakes you made, you always go back to that circumstance. I could, I could do this, but I did that. And I would want to move here and go in this area, but I messed up here. And what love does is love comes in and it dismantles the whole thing and says, no. Hmm. That was good. I didn't realize what I wrote down. Thank you, God. Love comes in and says, no more shame. I don't know what mistakes you've made, but I see something that God sees inside of you. And that's what I'm calling out, and that's what I need inside the body. Yeah, you've messed up, and yeah, you've made mistakes. We all have, but you know what? I choose to love you. And even though you're rough, and even though you're a little dusty right now, I choose to love you anyway. James uh, said these two things a couple of weeks ago. Two things for honor to occur. Really, really good. James is really, really good. First thing is attitude. Your inward person has to be right. And also, it has to have action, which is your outward. And he gave the example of a boy cleaning his room, that his father asks him to go clean his room. And the son can say, Yes, Dad, that's the best idea you've ever had. My room is dirty, so you recognize that your room is dirty, and I I really need to get it clean, really need to get in there and do this. But James said that, how many do you know that if he doesn't go clean his room, he's not honoring his father? Because you see, yeah, there's an inward uh, attitude of, yes, I recognize it, and yes, I need to do it, but there's no outward action. And without one or the other, it's counterfeit. So if we take that in the aspect of Christ as love, and we have an inward, yes, we need to love, and yes, we need to do that, but we have no outward action, that's counterfeit. So now, we're at the place that I wanted to get to today. If you'll turn to James 2. That was all a preview. (laughs) I went through this probably about three weeks ago. I was reading through these little study books, and uh, I saw a verse, James 2.8, that is probably one of the shorter verses for a sermon, but it packs a punch once you get in through it. And uh, we'll start in verse 8. If you really fulfill the royal law, you can circle that, underline it, highlight it. If you really fulfill the royal law according to Scripture, or the Scripture, You shall love your neighbor as yourself. You do well. When I came across this verse, it threw me back because to see something called a royal law, it grabbed my attention. Holy Ghost was like, boom, let's study on this for the next 30 years. And I was like, all right, let's do it. Because I want to say it again, but I want to say it three times, but in a little bit more detail. So royal law, or I could say this is the law of royalty, or... Love is the law of a royal people. So my question to you today is, are you a royal person? Yes. Yes. No trick questions today. Second question is, would this law apply to you? Yes. All right. Y'all are awake. It's okay. There's several points I want to write down. Uh, Six of them, actually, so you can number them one through six. Number one is its origin. This law, this royal law of love, comes from heaven's royalty, which is the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. And I want you to know that all expressions, all subjects, everything to do with the kingdom have to do with family and have to do with love. We see this in Matthew chapter 6, where Jesus is praying. He says, this is the way that you should pray. He says, our Father first thing he says is our Father. And it's awesome that God chose to call himself Father because what it does, I believe, is two things. 
One, he's giving you kind of a, a peek into him and revealing a side of him, but it's also drawing something out of you. And I came up with a perfect thing that I want you all to start calling me. When you address Daniel, I want you to just start saying Mighty Hunter. All right? Can we do that in here? All right. Because from now on, when you say Daniel, you don't have to say Daniel Hennessy. You can say, hey, Mighty Hunter, when you look at me, okay? That's my new name. What am I doing? I'm revealing a side of myself. Because now, when I go out and you're thinking, man, uh, that, that deer over there at 1,000 yards, nobody get. oh, wait. I know somebody who could get that. The mighty hunter could do that. All right, so I'm revealing a side of myself. But I'm also drawing something out of you. Because when you need a mighty hunter, when you see this nasty East Texas boar in your front yard and it's killing your little toy pets or whatever you got, who are you going to call? Ghostbusters. Now you're going to call Daniel because you're going to say, Daniel, mighty hunter, sorry, didn't mean to call you that again. I've got this nasty hog in my front yard, and I need somebody to get him. And I'm going to be like, you know what? I'll be there in 10 minutes. <laughs> Our Father, your kingdom come and your will be done. Your kingdom, which is family and love, and your will to be in a family. Where does it need to be? In earth, not on earth, in earth, in us. In this person standing up here today, in you, the kingdom of heaven, in you. Why? Because if we forget this, we forget that the kingdom is love and it's family. And we become just, uh, this is pretty intense when I was writing my notes. We become an empty organization just doing empty, meaningless nothing. Not bringing the kingdom and not truly affecting anything. So number one is its origin. Number two is its dignity. We can go through these quickly. It's a royal law. So there's nothing petty about love. There's nothing petty about a royal law. The third thing is its authority. The fact that it comes from God gives it a royal authority, the authority of heaven. And what, what's awesome about this is that you carry with you This royal law, you carry with you the authority of heaven. That when you walk into a situation, fear can't stay there. Regrets, mistakes, nothing can stay where perfect love comes in. And what's awesome about this, I gotta be careful how I word it too, is because I understand that we're new creatures, we're new creations. So we're we're being made perfect, but. We can actually do imperfect things. Does that make sense? So like some of the gifts we have, like we may not be able to give a a prophecy perfectly or do something perfectly, but there's something that you can actually do 100% of the time perfect every single time. Do you want to guess what it is? I was waiting for it. Y'all can love perfectly 100% of the time. You just choose to leave your will and your boundaries back and choose to love someone perfectly. Number four is its size. It doesn't include just us. Everybody say amen. But according to Luke 10, it means any and all people. And the fifth thing is its quality. The royalty is evident in its quality. Because we're instructed to love as thyself, but what happened in the new commandment? The new commandment that Jesus gave us. John 13, if you want to turn there. John chapter 13, we're going to start in uh, verse 34. John thirteen thirty four says, A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this, all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. What's interesting about this is that when Jesus gave this new commandment was moments after, literally moments after Judas ran out. And what is amazing about this story is that just after Jesus gave him the bread, after he took the bread, he says, go and do it quickly 
And everybody else thought he was going to buy other stuff, I guess, for the feast or something like that. But Jesus knew exactly where he was going and what he was doing. And moments after he sees this and this takes place, he turns around and he's looking at his other disciples. And if you could just be there in that room and just imagine what is going through Jesus' mind. And then he says, hey, I want to give you all a new command. It used to be love one another as you love yourself, but I want you to love one another as I have loved you. Even though somebody is ready to betray you, even though you're moments away from going to the most excruciating death, I want you to love one another as I have loved you. And that's because Jesus' love is unmerited, it's unselfish, and it's abiding. And we love him because he first loved us. So since his love is in us, here's a lot of loves in this sentence. So since his love is in us, we love one another. And when you love one another, that is the true mark of discipleship. And the last thing, number six, it's power. Love is called a royal law, which means it's a power, it's a force, and it's a dynamic. What's awesome is that we're praying for revival and we're praying for a move of God like we've never seen in our lifetimes. But what's intense about this is that if we don't have love and we don't have honor and we don't have relationships, what we'll do is we'll try and manufacture something. And we'll have classes and we'll have meetings and we'll have services but they'll be empty, and there'll be no expanding of the kingdom. And what we'll do is we'll have this move of God. He comes in. We have no relationship. We have no love, and it just dies down. And what is interesting is that this may have worked 10 years ago, 15 years ago, that I may have been satisfied when I was in high school of having the appearance of having something, but there's a generation that's coming up in young people that they want the real thing, that they're not going to stand for a substitution. They're not going to stand for a counterfeit, but they're only going to want the real thing. <laughs> I was telling James this morning, I had a whole pack of notes, and about 10 o'clock last night, they went to the garbage because the Holy Spirit wanted to do something else this morning. Are you all cool with that? I wanted to prophesy over some people, and so I wrote down these things. Last night, and even one of them this morning, I got some some revelation on. So there's three words he gave me, and uh, I wanted to release them. Really, I saw a specific person in these, but I believe it covered the whole body here. So as I'm speaking over this person, I just want everybody to kind of get in the position, put your hands forward, and be able to receive this. So just get ready. I saw Chris Sanders... Hey, buddy. (laughs) I saw you in the corner of a room. You had a robe on and you had a crown on your head, but you were leaning. If this was the corner of the room and this was a wall here, you had your hand on the wall and you were leaning forward and you were hunched uh, over like this because you were weeping so hard. You were crying out and I was like, oh, my God, is, is everything okay? You know, I'm standing in this part of the room, and I see you leaning over, and you're hunched like this because you have no more strength. Your legs are even starting to buckle, and you're, 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 you're just weeping. Tears are flowing down. And uh, I come up to you to talk to you and console you, so I was going to come up on this side with my left hand and put my hand on your shoulder. And as I put my hand on your shoulder, I saw your face, and uh, you weren't weeping. You are actually laughing so hard that you were crying that you had no strength in your legs or anything because you're having one of those gut laughs, the good ones. And you're trying to find strength pushing on the wall because because of the laughter that was coming out of you. And what I heard in the scripture was, weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. And that Bill even shared this a couple of weeks ago, and this verse has been burning in my heart because weeping may endure for a short season, But at the dawning of light in the morning, when God says, let there be light in that situation, the weeping is going to turn into joy. And you're actually where the enemy 
what's trying to hold you into a situation where you felt like you're weak and you can't do something is actually a place where you can stand up as royalty with a robe and a crown on your head, turn around and laugh in the devil's face. So if you want to receive that this morning, just put your hands in front of you. Father, we thank you, God, that you are a God of joy. You are joy. And Lord, we thank you that the weeping has ended this morning and there's joy and a dawning of light coming in this place. So Lord, we ask for every every situation, God, for your light of your presence to come and dawn on these people. In your name, amen. Second one. Y'all ready? Liz, good old buddy Liz. This is applies, I believe you can take it for every person in here, but more uh, for the women, I felt, in this one. And so, Liz, you're representative of the women in this place. I believe you were laying hands, and I saw you laying hands in this vision on young people, boys and girls, not like youth age, but like junior high and younger kids. And as you're laying your hand, this is where it gets weird. You're laying your hand on them, and uh, I love passion flowers. And it was like a purple, uh, greenish, velvet-looking thing coming out of your left hand as you were laying your hands on people's heads, these little kids. And uh, as you're praying over them and prophesying them, and like this message today, just giving love to these people, these little kids, as you put your hand on them, and this flower was in your hand, This is where it's weird. Uh, It began to sprout stuff out of their ears and their nose and their eyes and stuff, but it was actually not freaky. It was actually pretty cool. But flowers, because I was standing behind and I was watching what was happening here, flowers actually started to bloom out of the back of their head as you're laying your hands on them. And then in turn, they were able to turn to other people and share what you imparted. The verse, (laughs) Isaiah 61, to give them beauty for ashes and the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise, whoa, for the spirit of heaviness. that they may be called trees of righteousness, that the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. And whatever problems these young people have with their fathers and their mothers, where there was destruction, where there was ashes, there's now beauty and life and flowers coming out, old mindsets, and old ways they thought about their father in the heaven has passed away, and new life is coming out of that. Thank you, Father. If you want to receive that, put your hands out in front of you. Thank you, Father, for mindsets changing in this place. Thank you, Father, that as we lay hands on people and impart things to them, new life comes out of their mindsets, and their, their hearts and their, their soul is being changed. Thank you, Jesus, for joy coming in and beauty for these ashes where they thought that there's nothing that could ever come out of this. But, Father, we thank you for life and beauty from your kingdom coming through them. Thank you, Father. Whoa. Number three. This is the last one. This is for every person in here. And what I would like to do, and I'll just say that after I share it with you, because I want us to get together and pray over one another. Uh, Thank you, Jesus, for iPads. They mess up. All right. I saw a human. So it was a man and a woman. It was weird. But it was, I believe, kind of like a... uh, showing what every person is in this place. So you could be a man or a woman in this place. I believe it applies to everyone. You're running in battle. You were going as fast as you can. You had your sword, your uh, shield, and you were just taking ground. You were doing really good, and then boom, you were hit with a spear. And uh, a long spearhead uh, hit right in your left shoulder. And uh, you dug in pretty deep. It didn't hit any, like, major arteries or anything, but you are bleeding pretty good. But you patched it up, and you kind of held it, and you took the staff, and you broke off the staff, and then pulled off the end, got it out, but you still had the spearhead in there. And then came the time for you to actually pull this spearhead out, 
but you chose to leave it in for some reason. And what you did is you took a coat, and I saw written on the back of this coat, it was a like a trench coat. Uh, it had the word oppression on it, and you took that coat and you put it on, buttoned it, and you left it on, and you said, no, I choose not to take this out, and I choose to leave it in. And you said, because I deserve this, and now it's a part of my identity. And infection is now setting in. And then I saw when I was, because I I don't know how to explain it, I, I knew what the person was thinking, or the woman was thinking, and they said, I can survive under this coat because the devil won't come any further if I wear this coat and I'm safe under here. And you were deceived. The truth is that I saw you backed into a corner and you were allowing this coat to cover what God is wanting to heal. So, what I would like to do, if this does apply to you, or the first two things that I released, I would like for us to stand, if you would, I can't be up here and not get people to stand up. If you're a part of a life group, if you'll find your life group in this place and y'all get in a group, if you're not a part of a life group, you find the group that looks the smallest and now you're a part of that life group. But uh, go ahead and get with them. So we're going to take just a couple of seconds to find your life group. Y'all get together, kind of join together. Yeah, over here. Or another over here. So get with your life group. What I want you to do, after I get some Kleenex. Oh, sorry. One, I just want you to be touching somebody in your group so y'all can hold each other's shoulders, hold each other's hands. I want some hands-on touchy-feelies. And what I want is for you just to begin... Yeah, everybody in the group. If you're not in a group, find a group. But I want you to start loving on people, and I want you to just start prophesying. If you see something, I want you to start speaking that out, releasing it over them, telling them this is what I see, this is what I feel. I want you to do that. And then if you would be so bold as to come inside of your group, and if not, that's okay. We can talk after service. But what I would like is... For you to share with your group, say that I'm that person and I'm putting on this coat and I'm trying to cover up something that's really hurt me, something that's wounded me and almost killed me, but I feel safe here and I feel like I can continue on and I can survive. And that word right there is going to leave this place. There's no surviving, but there's only thriving here this morning. So, Father, I just release these groups. Y'all can go ahead and begin to pray, speak over one another. Thank you, Father.